Welcome back to Senate Education on February 16th. We're now shifting our conversation to uh, vaccinations in schools. Uh, Dr. Levine, Secretary French, great to have both of you with us. Uh, as the Committee uh, on Education, we thought it uh, a priority to have a conversation around vaccinations. What does it look like going back to school after the summer? What should we be thinking about now? Uh, in, in, I'm, I'm thinking two things, certainly around, and we also have the Chair of Health and Welfare and uh, usually a majority of that committee here as well, um, which is great and a huge help to this conversation. So, um, so let me frame it up with two things. Number one, the COVID piece, uh, COVID vaccination man mandates, whether or not we should uh, do that. I'm also wondering if you might, in your comments, mention if other states, I did a quick Google search, it looked like maybe California and Louisiana were doing it, but I, I could be wrong. The other piece is actually a bill in Senator Lyons committee that I have, and I'm just, and we don't need to really jump into this, but just know, because it's actually, it's really in Senator Lyons jurisdiction, not this committee's, but um, at some point, even later, I'd love to just talk about, uh, the religious exemption. But today, let's talk just about um, COVID. So with that, uh, floor is yours. Easy topics, easy topics. Yeah, good afternoon, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Maybe uh, since this uh, you started with a health prompt, this would be more appropriate for Dr. Levine to begin this time. Hi, Mark Levine, Commissioner of Health. Um, I'm going to try to respond to what you just put into a big package. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this isn't my day, by the way, Dr. Levine. I'm, I'm really not knocking it out of the park. So you'll have to, you'll have to just bear with me. I'm sorry. This could be my last day here. The first day I come back to the state house could be my last. Uh, but uh, I think you, you know what, what I'm getting at. I do. So okay. Thanks. Uh, let me start with a little uh, history. Um, because obviously we do have some vaccines that are required for the K through 12 levels. Okay. And normally we're quite cautious about that. We, in our normal course of business, we usually await expert guideline setting panels and don't just go out there on our own, so to speak. So whether we're talking FDA, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, ASIP, or CDC, um, but our history with the current required vaccines is we're pretty consistently around the 95% range. So very successful with um, students in all those grades. And there's a report coming out in four to six weeks that will be the most recent year's experience, which should again uh, be at the same high level. Um, <clears throat> Normally, just to give you an idea of process, we, we would have a tremendous amount of stakeholder engagement. We at the Department of Health would look at all of the science. We would come to our own uh, conclusion. We would get the input from our pediatric colleagues at AAP and uh, the pediatric infectious disease community input as well. We have an immunization advisory council you've heard about and talked about previously within Vermont, and we would want them to deliberate as well because their charge is to make formal recommendations to me as the commissioner of health. We would then have to engage in a rule change process and obviously that would involve some public inquiry and input as well uh, that becomes part of that process. Um, and we would uh, certainly have to justify, if you will, if I could use that term, why Vermont should jump out ahead of any of these other national expert guideline setting bodies or panels or ASIP. Um, did you want me to address some specific items about COVID uh, that explain uh, why this didn't happen yesterday? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Obviously, we know that uh, there's a paucity of severe outcomes in our children. 
that's been very consistent. And even though the news headlines when people over-dramatize things during Omicron has been more pediatric hospitalizations than ever, uh, that is probably true because there were more cases of Omicron than ever everywhere around the country. But that doesn't mean kids were having worse outcomes. It just means a very low rate of severe outcome was magnified by the large number of people uh, afflicted by getting the virus. Um, as you know, the vaccine uh, has been available to our adolescents for some time this year, but the 5 to 11 has been the most recent, and they are very recent. And the 0 to 4, of course, uh, is still pending and not on the agenda for the FDA's advisory panel yet because the data is really not ready. Um, our own experience in Vermont is quite good right now. We are up to a 65% rate in our 5 to 11 age group. We're well in the 70s in the adolescents. Um, and in that 65%, 54% of what we would term fully vaccinated, meaning both doses, and 6% have received one dose. The um, Uptake has been steadily increasing, and we don't actually know the final landing point yet because it continues to be a moving target. So all of that is advisory to us right now, if you will, and we are watching the data closely. We are aware that we have abundant testing capabilities in schools. Nurses can do symptomatic testing of children who become symptomatic at school. Um, and so we have a lot of windows into understanding the impact of both vaccination and the disease uh, on our pediatric population. Um, and so that's sort of a lay of the land as, as it is right now. I'm trying to remember all the things you mentioned in your preamble, if I've covered them all. I didn't cover the other states, but I'll let Secretary well, French. Maybe this is, maybe this is. So, so are you recommending uh, as the state's chief medical officer that as we move back, are you thinking about getting to the point where next fall, as we're starting to talk to constituents and others, that the state of Vermont would mandate COVID vaccines for students. So are we thinking about it? We think about a lot of things all of the time. Well, okay, this all right, let me- something we're thinking yeah, about. Yes, yes. So, so this is in the, this is a possibility. Oh, absolutely, it's in the realm of possibility, but it's okay. not something we are thinking about today as something that, my gosh, we need to make a quick decision on this. I'll tell you, Levine, you're starting to sound like a politician. Thing. You're really starting- I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I do believe that um, the data is supporting a yeah. more, um, what's the word? Um, I don't want to say we're sitting on our heels, but oh, sure. a, more a more deliberate stance. Okay. Uh, because it is a moving target. And we are having great success. And knock on wood, uh, the experience in kids in our state has been wonderful. Um, we have not had the level of serious outcome. Sometimes it only takes one or two bad outcomes to generate you know, sufficient uh, energy, enthusiasm, alarm in the public and even in state health officials to want to do something. Um, it would have to take a lot of really bad outcomes now because things have been really going very well with regard to our children and with regard to our ability to keep our schools open and keep in-person education going. Um, and that's getting better all the time. So we need to keep thinking about this unquestionably, but yeah. we don't need to think about it in an urgent manner at this time. Okay. Dr. Levine, so what would the process be to get to that point? I know that there's a, there's a council. So what sorts of... Uh, if I were talking to a constituent, the deliberations, uh, this is, I know you, you're not, yeah. you don't make decisions on your, you know, you, you have a team, you have folks 
And tell us a little bit about that council and how it meets and, and do they give recommendations to you, et cetera? Absolutely. So the council just had its first meeting okay. um, for the last somewhere under two years. It's supposed to meet yeah. annually, but with the pandemic, it didn't have its meeting a year ago. Um, the meeting was mostly uh, operational, I would label it, um, okay. but understanding what the future agenda could hold. Um, the council's charge is essentially to make recommendations to the Commissioner of Health regarding uh, vaccination schedules for students K through 12. Um, and it is advisory in that regard. It makes a recommendation. It, it obviously would get some of the same input I get from my own department because we would have members of our immunization uh, program on the council and available to the council so that all of the important data regarding other vaccines and their performance in a required versus non-required stance uh, would come to light and uh, their understanding of the up-to-date data on this vaccine uh, would come to light as well so that they could use that in their deliberations. We would also seek as much input as we could from those uh, federal and national bodies, whether they be in the government, meaning FDA, CDC, ACIP, or whether they be in the more professional uh, organization structures like Infectious Disease Society of America, AAP for the pediatricians, uh, academic home, et cetera. So a lot of pieces going into the hopper uh, to enable us to come to a uh, reasoned con uh, conclusion uh, regarding what we wanted to do. Um, I hope that answers that. Yeah, no, that's helpful. So when, uh, I think the other question I would have is how how often does the group meet? Uh, and, and I'm not. And the only reason I'm asking is I'm yeah. trying to get a sense of would. Uh, it doesn't sound as though you would anticipate it being February that a mandate for vaccinations would would for COVID vaccinations would happen before the end of the school year. It would be perhaps it's more of a, a look to to the fall. That's what I would think. Okay. So certainly we want the council to meet again just to do its usual work, which yeah. would be to re you know this report that's coming out in four to six weeks, to be able to review that, understand where we are with the traditional uh, vaccine schedule and how Vermont schools are doing with it and how Vermonters are doing with it. So we want that input for sure. And uh, one would think it beyond belief if COVID wasn't at least on the agenda uh, sure. as an item for them to begin to uh, have a discourse on, even if it wasn't as formal as having a thousand pieces of input and testimony. Yeah. And before I pass to Senator Lyons, and I apologize if you've already said this, what percentage of our uh, students, uh, you know, K through 12 are vaccinated that are at, please? On, on COVID? For COVID, COVID. Uh, so for, yeah, K through 12, I, I mean, I gave you the 65% for five to 11 age. Uh, you're now asking five to 17, which I do have somewhere. Give me a second. It doesn't have to happen right now. I was you just... gave us 70% for the adolescents, so. Well, in the 70s, yeah. yeah. But, um... roughly, so about roughly 65% of the kids that are in schools right now, something like that are vaccinated. Yeah, let me get you a precise okay. number. That's fair. Absolutely. Senator Lyons. Yeah, no. Uh, so as the discussion is going on and you're uh, very definitely going to be listening to CDC as well, I would think. Um, and kids are, kids are different uh, from what we've seen happen in adults. But I can't help but ask my health and welfare question, which is around the next booster shot and what you're learning about that, because that will that'll affect adults and it'll affect children ultimately. But I'm just is there any 
I know that I, when I read it, just all over Robin Hood's barn. But what 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 are you getting out of the um, information about the next shot for people? So you're referring, in a sense, to the fourth shot as opposed yes, to. Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So just so I everybody's clear. That. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So <laughs> everybody's clear. We consider for the mRNA vaccine, the words fully. Uh, vaccinated now include the two shot series. We look at fully protected and up to date as it being a three shot series. That third shot sometimes called a booster, but I believe that's actually not what it is. It's just part of your initial series to get your immunity up to par. So Senator Lyons is now referring to yet a fourth shot and at one interval that would occur. So the CDC just came out in the last um, week or so with more formal recommendations again, because they changed the, the interval dosing for immunocompromised people, which gave them another opportunity to uh, review it again for the general. Sir, you're muted. You're muted, doctor. I don't know how these things happen. Right okay. now, um, <laughs> Right now, the uh, general public third dose is listed as five months, whereas previously it was at six months. So that's changed. There's been no foreshadowing of yet another dose. And I think part of that is because of the fact that Omicron is now so much on the retreat throughout the country uh, at different way, different places, different rates, um, that it's no longer as serious a consideration for giving people yet another shot. So what's going to happen is people are going to do studies and continue to follow immunity levels, mainly by neutralizing antibody levels of VEX uh, 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 in their bloodstream, uh, to see how much waning occurs in individual people over time. Second thing that will occur is there will be more whole genome sequencing than ever before, so that if another variant comes along, we'll help hopefully have the lead time to do the laboratory experiments to know if current vaccines will still be effective or if there'll be what's called immune evasion uh, on the part of the next variant form to the vaccines that exist. But there's been no talk about a fourth dose yet, and everyone from Dr. Fauci to the CDC director, everyone down has been very cautious about saying, we don't believe the data shows this is needed at this time, and we're just gonna have to wait and be patient. But to make sure everybody on the call understands, if you are at all immunocompromised, all of those individuals should have a fourth shot. And that's very clear in the newest uh, iteration of the guidelines. And the interval for that happening has moved even closer to after um, basically a month or more after the third dose of your vaccine, you're eligible already for a booster. So that's a different population, makes up a few percent of the total population. So what, um, as kids, are, the kids who are vaccinated, what are you hearing about the their transmission of the virus, even though they may be vaccinated? I mean, are kids are kids mm -hmm. the little carriers that people had been talking about early on? I think with Omicron, that's proving to be more true than it was earlier on, yeah. to be honest. Um, but the reality is, yes, I mean, they. Every human being has been more susceptible to nasal infection with Omicron as the portal of entry and potentially being able to transmit to others. I don't believe prior to Omicron it was as dramatic as that. Thank you. Senator Persley. Thank you. Did, I don't want to go into too many questions if we were also going to hear some kind of presentation from Secretary. French, or, or are we just all questions today? Well, this is a this is a good conversation. Do you want to just go ahead and ask it? And yeah, 
and it was just about this definition of vaxxed and unvaxxed or vaccinated and unvaccinated because uh, I just want to make sure I have that clear. Like when I look at the Department of Health website, when it says, you know, you have a lot of nice graphs about, you know, vaccinated and unvaccinated, that's the two shots. Because what you, what I heard, I think I heard you say, I just want to make sure I get this right, that vaccinated is two shots, even though fully protected is two shots in the booster. Right. But and we, we, show, we, show it, we show it both ways now. Okay. So, and that, and that just went live actually. So you can go on the vaccine dashboard and it will show who's gotten boosted as well as who's just gotten the, the full series. And then, so, but fully vaccinated is two shots. Are you saying it's the three? No, it's the two. We haven't verged from the national definition. We've okay. just brought in the amount of data we're providing. And then, yeah, that's, that's, that's helpful. And I think I did see a graph on BT Digger that did break it out like that which was helpful and then so somebody that has just one shot do they fall on the unvaccinated or the vaccinated pot they fall at in the category as have received at least one dose okay that's another category <laughs> between you and me it was worthless for them to get vaccinated well, the two of you and everybody listening throughout the United States. Right. But, <laughs> but it is true. One dose, sure. one dose is sure. not going to really help anybody in this age of Omicron right. and right. beyond. Though I don't want to appear um, non-compassionate because there may be people who said, my adverse reaction was so severe that I cannot get another dose of this. And I have to respect that in them. And also trying to tie your comments, Senator Perchick, with uh, Senator Lyons, just keep in mind that the five to 11 year age range only gets two doses at this point. That's all that's been authorized under the EUA. But if I, if I see a graph that says, these are the unvaccinated, that, that, that's prop, that is including the single? No, unvaccinated means nothing. Nothing, okay. And then hopefully as we get more data, we can break it out. Like you said, you just, you're just done, but okay. Well, I have other questions, but we can go on. Okay. Uh, so just for clarification. So when Senator Persix was talking, so am I, I have, as an adult, I, I have my booster. Is that considered fully vaccinated or is just the two shots considered fully vaccinated? The two shots, is okay. really the, nat the national uh, definition for that's the national vaccine. definition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Until it changes. Until it changes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Anything else for Dr. Levine at this point? He's going to be with us for a little bit because uh, we have questions. Please, uh, Senator Persley. Well, I do have another question that's probably more for Dr. Levine, and that is yeah, on the vaccine schedule, is there a time? Have, have we ever taken off a vaccine off the schedule? Like, I, I don't know, polio or something probably at one point was required and, and isn't. I guess the advisory council, you said that's their normal work. They look at the schedule. And then is there a time where, you know, if the, if the disease isn't around or if like every, if we're at 99% vaccine, does it come off that requirement? So, so I don't know if it has anything to do with the advisory council, but <clears throat> certainly smallpox would fall in that category that because that's now considered a pretty much eradicated disease. <clears throat> that's a pretty rare phenomenon. Um, and, and we certainly would never go with just the Vermont Immunization Advisory Council recommendation on that. We would hope they were bringing it to our attention because we hadn't gotten there yet. And everybody in the healthcare world was saying, we don't need this vaccine anymore. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, Secretary French, uh, thanks for being with us. Any comments related to uh, you know, responses to some of the questions you've heard or anything, additional thoughts uh, that Dr. Levine left out or anything at all? No, not really. Um, I, as Secretary of Education, I am a member of the Advisory Council. So I think, you know, you've heard from Dr. Levine that the function of the Advisory Council is just that, to advise the Department of Health, and it has a uh, statutory purpose that uh, predates COVID. Uh, we certainly um, have this on our radar uh, to address the COVID issue. Uh, we did have a meeting uh, recently. It was largely an organizational meeting. We still have 
a pediatric uh, member that needs to be appointed by the governor. Uh, the previous member had retired fairly recently. And then uh, Dr. Levine has the authority to appoint uh, several members, as he mentioned, uh, largely, most likely from his staff and immunization expertise from the health department. So that council, uh, you know, will be constituted uh, and will begin working on this issue in the coming weeks and months. Um, but other than that, to your comment about what's going around nationally, I, you know, I too am an observer of some of that. So. Um, it is what I'm seeing right now is largely just political activity, uh, certainly at the state level. Um, you, know, you mentioned Louisiana. I think you know Louisiana is a good example where uh, they had a legislative committee recommend not to mandate the vaccine. I believe the governor vetoed that and then uh, put put COVID on the mandatory list under his own authority or whatever authority they've delegated to the governor. Oh. Uh, then we see a lot of districts also, uh, that's another level of activity. So it's not just state level activity. So there's activity around school districts themselves, particularly some of the larger urban school districts are taking that up. I think that's really how the ball got rolling in California when LA and Oakland were in San Diego, were thinking about that. Um, so we've seen that level of activity. And then there's uh, what I observe, another layer of activity uh, that's focused on athletics specifically. So we've seen school districts around the country mandate vaccination for athletes um, for as a condition of participation in winter sports and so forth. So again, largely uh, my from an anthropological perspective, I would suggest it's largely political activity at this point. Um, but we are we are connected through our national organizations, and I think that's one of the things we've leveraged. And you know, Dr. Levine and I have been a lot of the meetings together and worked closely on various issues related to schools. So we do leverage our national organizations, and so we're we're tied into those conversations as they emerge. Um, but um, you know, we're very pleased at this point with the level of uptake in vaccination at our schools. As you know, we're we're endeavoring to do some reporting on that information. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's again, uh, always challenging when we're doing these data tasks that rely on joint agency cooperation and coordination because we, uh, we have pretty substantial data protections and privacy protections enacted in our various agencies. So when we work across those boundaries, it can be challenging, but I think in a good way. Um, so we are working on that. I think it is, um, as we come through the Omicron surge, we're, we're very interested in uh, focusing on those ecosystems, those school districts that haven't achieved higher vaccination rates. Uh, I think it's a good proxy for um, operational stability going forward because we'll, we'll likely see other variants. So we'll continue to have cases in schools and that'll come and go on a cyclical basis. And um, I think we think often about those lower vaccination rates in some districts and ecosystems contributing to more instability. So we want to think about what we can do to support them, certainly to improve their vaccination, but just to ensure that we can keep those schools open for those kids. Senator Lyons, you have your hand up. Yes. So, I, I mean, as you're going through the discussion with the advisory group um, and from your, your perspective uh, in AOE, one of the things, of course, that we've always been concerned about is ensuring that there's plenty of time for notice. So regardless of what's going on out here in the real world, in terms of the, the virus or not the virus, I mean, it makes it so difficult. I appreciate that. But have you set kind of a, a time in your own mind after what, uh, where the decision has to be made about whatever conditions should be in place when kids and teachers go back to school in the fall. And I, you know, I also know there's summer school, after school stuff going on, you know, so it's continuous, but I think parents are looking for the day the door reopens in the fall. So do you have kind of a timeline that you're putting in place or thinking about? And you're muted. <laughs> Not really. Oh, I just, uh, yeah. um, I haven't thought actually directly about the specific issue because so much of it is dependent on the science. You know, as Dr. Levine described, there's multiple layers of, and, and I think again, appropriately, multiple layers of scientific review that need to occur. I can just fall back on my um, experience leading school districts that, you know, in August, August is always a busy month uh, for schools. That's where a lot of, we see a lot of enrollments up until the last week or so before school starts. 
So I would think, you know, certainly um, the best case scenario would be if there was some requirement like this coming down in August, if not early August, would be useful uh, to to allow people to make those decisions. But again, I haven't intersected that sort of, let's say, my experience reference with the practical aspects of how long does it take to stand up vaccination clinics and how long does it take to get people fully vaccinated? You know, what would that look like? So I haven't done any of that calculus yet. Well, and I'm, I, I guess I'm thinking um, in particular about notifying parents, uh, you know, what, how much time does it take to get the notice out to folks so we don't run into some of the issues that we've seen, um, you know, with the reopening of schools, sure. uh, you know, all those questions. Well, it is, you know, back to sort of the observations and the lessons learned nationally. I think that's precisely, um, you know, part some of the problems we've seen, you know, where uh, I think California announced a certain date, then they found out that would exclude a large number of students from Los Angeles from being able to attend school. So, you know, those things have to, the operational aspects have to be factored into that decision making. Um, but what would, um, you know, if we think about sort of the ideal of, noting parents, letting parents know in the summer in advance of the fall, that would be sort of a best case scenario. But what's proposed, you know, propelling people forward in the case of California, for example, I'm sure is a sense of urgency over the public health uh, requirement. So conceivably, these kinds of decisions can be made mid-year. And um, then it's, then it really does become a function of logistics and ensuring people have access and uh, are motivated and have the right communications and so forth. So Again, hard to predict uh, how this would play out, um, but we do, um, you know, I, I would just reflect and say we have uh, the appropriate structures in place as a state to make sense of these decisions. Uh, we've been fortunate to have so many different um, experts weighing in, um, have, have been very generous with their time throughout our management of the pandemic, whether it be the infectious disease docs at uh, UVM or the pediatric experts that we have. Everyone's really, uh, you know, chipped in to contribute to uh, the safety of our school. So I think we're poised to to make sense of this and to, to be proactive as we have throughout the pandemic. Uh, but it's not clear to me yet what shape that decision making will take or what trajectory it would have. Senator Pershler. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to slip in two questions. One is about the, I heard, saw from the governor's press conference on Tuesday about the masks and how that relates to vaccines. So. I haven't read the article, so maybe you can just update me because I think I saw 80% vaccine and and that's related to the mask. So maybe you can just update us on that thinking and policy and if that's settled or still something to think about. And the other just question I have that, that you two probably can, or anybody who may be here can remind me, we don't have mandates anywhere else. Like this state employees are, are encouraged to get vaccinated, but if you don't get vaccinated, you can test and still go to work if, I, if I'm correct. Am I correct that there is no absolute mandate for vaccine anywhere that the state has done? I know the feds have their mandate for like certain fed workers, but am I correct that we don't have any mandates in the state for vaccines? Well, I'll start off with um, just an update from the press conference, so to speak. And we had um, a policy mechanism, we'll call it this 80% threshold. <laughs> that we had written into our guidance back in August, um, you know, to go live in September, a totally different moment in time, sort of pre-Delta, you know, and um, we were intending, and I think appropriately seeking to leverage our, what has emerged as a national leader in terms of school level vaccination. Um, and also wanted to, you know, encourage to provide incentive to that. That's the challenge with lauding our accomplishment because we still have a lot of work to do and we really those last mile issues so to speak in terms of vaccination are, are some of the harder ones so we did we did uh, uh, create that mechanism and then uh, put it on delay I think at least three times because you know that we started getting into the delta um, context we weren't weren't satisfied that that was an appropriate decision and it was in January, um, as we were dealing with Omicron, that we delayed it again and said it would go live February 28th. Um, didn't we certainly suspected? I think you know that Omicron would have that steep sort of Omicron curve and the steep decline, uh, and that's more or less played out uh, as we predicted in that regard. But uh, 28th was essentially picked out. You know, it's the other side of student vacation, February vacation. So let's let's go with that as sort of the next milestone, and if we need to, we'll delay it again. 
So what we announced on uh, Tuesday was that we're not going to delay it again. So it, it goes operational. But I think more to the point, um, you know, that the idea of the threshold was something we had inherited. I would say inherited. We created back in August in a different moment of time. So we felt it's a useful tool. We've we've talked about it enough. We've delayed it enough. Let's start. Uh, but what we've been thinking more about is just the general trends that we're on. It's not so much a specific threshold. Um, you know, as I said at the press conference, we see Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, not not surprisingly states that entered the Omicron uh, surge earlier than Vermont and exited it earlier than Vermont, uh, making decisions to rem remove masks now. Uh, Rhode Island's a little later on March 4th. But um, so we we're signaling that we're on this we're on this sort of glide slope, if you will, towards we'll call it more endemic management. And I think the real my takeaway on that is that um, schools will no longer need separate mitigation requirements than the broader societal mitigation requirements. So there's no special reason that schools need protection. And we had to have those special reasons before because we had a large number of the population, namely students that weren't eligible for vaccination. So we erected a multi-layer response to keep them safe and also education as a policy priority. But uh, as, we, as we're contemplating sort of the post-Omicron environment, I think, you know, Dr. Levine uh, would agree that it's accelerated our thinking, you know, about endemic and where we're heading. And certainly there will be variants, they will come and go, we'll continue to have cases in schools and so forth. But my observation, largely with vaccination, is that we've, in spite of these fluctuations, we've, since the beginning of the year, we've, and since last spring, we've been on this trajectory of continually uh, driving down the risks from the virus. You know, it's vaccine has been a significant contributing factor in that trajectory but we have the new treatments coming online and so forth. So that, you know, as in spite of the cyclical experience that schools have experienced uh, directly on a daily basis, in the background has been this, this movement of vaccination that's really driving down the risk. So we're at that point where we can contemplate uh, removing some of those measures. And this is where we start to, and this is where everyone is intersecting the, the risks from uh, mass relative to an educational perspective versus the health uh, perspective. And we have, growing understanding that, that masks are causing some anxiety, if you will. They're certainly, they interfere with some of the instructional opportunities inside of schools. We have, we have schools in the state that still haven't enabled music this winter because they've been fearful of that. And mass, masking with musical instruments, we spent a lot of time on that last winter, is really kind of tricky. Um, but at any rate, uh, we, we don't feel that's necessary now, but we still have schools doing those things. So we have to kind of move down this trajectory of weaning people off those types of uh, mitigation, self homegrown mitigation measures. And so what we announced on Tuesday is like, we're going to, we're going to do the 80%. We've talked about it enough. We just think it's a good way to get people moving in that direction. We're, we're behind the other New England states a little bit, but at some point in the not too distant future, it's likely we're going to recommend a removal of masks altogether. It still would be a local option. So school districts would have the option to keep the masks in place. And I think we'll see a lot of individual decision-making, which I think is great. And Dr. Levine, I think would agree. That's that's kind of where this is heading is like each of us has to do that risk assessment. And we also have to think about the people next to us in a respectful and uh, kind way. You know, not if someone sitting next to you doesn't have a mask on, it doesn't mean bad things. You know, they're they're doing that own risk, their own risk assessment. But, um, you know, increasingly, we just have to acknowledge in Vermont, our schools are incredibly safe. You know, I made the point on Tuesday. I, I don't know you know, which schools in the world are safer than Vermont's due to our higher vaccination rates and so forth and our strict adherence to our mitigation measures. Um, so we, we need to have the courage to make that next step. But it's, it is a, we prefer to take a phased approach to so the 80% sort of like a toe in the water. Uh, but that, that decision is coming soon. And we want to give folks enough notice to start thinking about those things and starting to work towards a personal and organizational level of acceptance that it's okay and you can do it. So do I did, I, did I hear that? AOE has a list of, of where everybody is like, we know there are some schools that are over 80%. Yeah, that's what we're working on now is alluding to we have, we took, um, we're working on some joint agreements between our agencies to take uh, the immunization registry information and intersect that with the enrollment data. So when, when students, uh, children were getting vaccinated, they, they were not required to disclose the school that they attended. So we had no way to sort of do that match. Our first attempt at this started before the holiday. We were asking nurses to identify uh, the percentage of students that are vaccinated in their school by going into the registry. Um, and that we, we only got about a 50% response rate to that because the nurses were just 
you know, buried with contact tracing and everything else. And so we had to think about another way to do it. Actually, at the beginning of the school year, we thought of doing it this way too, but we didn't have accurate enrollment information. The enrollment information doesn't, uh, the reporting deadline isn't October 1st, and then we go through a big cleanup process. So it's only recently that we have stable enrollment information from October 1, which is, you know, outdated, but at least it's stable. So we're trying to do that match right now. I think, you know, again, our, our interest was to prepare for that sort of next level of policy iteration where we wanted to focus in on specific districts and schools to find out what supports would be useful to them if they had lower vaccination rates. It wasn't so much to think about, oh, what can we do to raise those vaccination rates? So certainly we are interested in that, but it's also to acknowledge, you know, again, this idea of organ or operational stability that those districts that have lower rates, we should prepare for them having difficulty staying open during times of surge. So we want to figure out what supports are necessary to enable them to keep the schools open for kids. Other questions for Dr. Levine or Secretary French? Secretary, uh, I could answer the okay. second question that Senator oh, yeah. Perkins had. Um, we don't have an absolute mandate for state employees, but we have a requirement that state employees be vaccinated, but it has an off ramp. So if they so choose to remain unvaccinated, they don't lose their job. They are, uh, they must attest to their status and to the fact that they will have testing performed on a regular basis, which is usually occurring at their site of work for most people. Um, so they don't have to travel a lot to get that done. Do you know what percentage of state workers have been vaccinated? Yes, I, today I heard the number was 94%. Okay, thanks. That's true. Um, Senator Campion? Yeah. Could I share my screen for a second to answer the question Absolutely. I could answer previously? Absolutely. Daphne will uh, grant permission. There you go. Hopefully people can see something. Yeah. OK, so these are publicly available slides that are on the DFR website. And uh, this is the most recent week. Um, we don't show all of these at every press conference because the press conference would be even longer than they currently are. Um, but this shows the remarkable performance uh, of our youth and, and really reflective of their parents, of course, as well, with regard to vaccine in the age groups you requested. So this is 5 to 17, so K through 12, essentially. And you can see the robust rate uh, that we are way ahead of the majority of the nation at 76.3% starting vaccination. Then if we move to fully vaccinated, meaning they've gotten two doses, almost, uh, well, it is two thirds essentially. Uh, again, uh, way ahead. And then for those eligible for a booster, which means age 12 to 17, 34.5%. Mm. And then finally, just looking at where we are with our vaccination progress, um, if you look at the juniors and seniors in high school, if I could characterize this bar graph uh, a bit more broadly than perhaps I should, we're up at around 80%. Everybody uh, in the middle and early high school years 75%. And then, of course, our newest population, lower than those two. But uh, this is really, you know, substantial progress. Dr. Levy, um, would you go just back to that, the slide that mentioned the 34%? I missed, is that 34% yes. have gotten the second shot? No. No, I'm sorry. Third, third shot. Oh, the third shot. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, these numbers are, yeah, this is uh, really, really good news. Is yeah, there could, that you, you don't, you know, I think of a, like a lot of 18 year olds as being seniors uh, Why you cut it off at 17. Um, is that, is that, that, the that has to do with the EUA that came out um, and what age range. Okay. Everything before was 18 and older. Yep. Okay. I was going to add some commentary from, Please. that's okay, Senator Perchuk's question, you know, about uh, state. 
And I would just say, I think that, you know, we have, as Dr. Levine described, that state requirement. And that's, I think, useful to think about in terms of not so much as a state requirement, but an employer-employee sort of uh, association. And we have that playing out in school districts as well. There have been several school districts who have explored that uh, by leveraging their employer-employee relationship to require a vaccination. Um, but, I, you know, I just make the observation on our uh, student vaccination data we um, and draw the distinction between staff vaccination versus student vaccination because we have a, a high degree of staff vaccination in the state, well over 90 percent, we suspect. And we think that's very consistent, you know, regardless of if you're in Canaan or, um, you know, in Williston, it, the rate is very high. The student vaccination rate, on the other hand, uh, varies considerably. We know that already just in the patterns of the, like, on a county basis and so forth, and we suspect that will play out at the school level. But it's interesting to note, if you think about Vermont's population and where the density of our population exists, it exists in Chittenden County, which tends to be a more progressive, I'll say, political area. I'm providing political commentary today. This is great. Um, you think about Chittenden County being more progressive and perhaps more interested in mitigation measures, and that's precisely where a lot of our population is concentrated. So it shouldn't surprise folks that we have a state-level rate that's considerably higher. And if you compare perhaps to a southern New England state, a lot of their densely populated urban centers are are really tough nuts to crack relative to vaccination, right? So they have distrust, people of color, distrust of government and so forth. So we have some advantages in our regard, but we we have this other Vermont as well as you get out in the rural landscape. And that's where, you know, we I call it the last mile to borrow the metaphor from broadband. We, we have to get down to those small, very small economies of scale to push the needle on vaccination. Hey, that's a good one too, push the needle on vaccination. Um, we have a lot of work to do in the landscape, and it doesn't really result, you know, in, uh, you know, we take a batch of vaccine up to Canaan, it isn't necessarily an efficient way, you know, there isn't a large number of people there to do that. But those are the kinds of issues we have to address in sort of the next level. That's why it's important that we maintain the momentum, uh, because we, we it is pretty amazing how uh, a high rate we've been able to achieve, but we still have a lot of, a lot of work to do in the landscape, and to keep that momentum moving is important. Great. <laughs> And I, and I completely uh, support it and agree with everything Secretary French just said. Uh, and we have maintained school-based clinics and community clinics throughout the state. So these opportunities have been ongoing. Um, and based on whatever data we now have to analyze about the student vaccination rates in some of these settings, we may need to adapt strategies again to, to meet the need. Um, and at the, just in sort of tying in the slides we just viewed, um, we are doing remarkably in Vermont. I think if there's anything I showed you, it's the fact that most of the country is not doing remarkably yet with the uptake in our youth. And we are doing remarkably. So I fully support and will continue having the kinds of conversations we're having today. Uh, but you can see that we are still so far out in front that we don't want to prematurely make any decisions that with time, the state may arrive at the destination anyways without uh, enforcement, if you will, of a, a mandate kind of level, uh, because we're just seeing the growth in this continue to occur. So just to be cognizant of that. Dr. Levine or uh, Secretary French, do either of you know, have a sense out there about the third shot, the sort of drop off. I, and I wonder if it also, if you see it in adults sometimes that people go for the two and then, you know, the third, it's just not happening. Is, are, is there some, some sort of anecdotal info or, or scientific info on that? Yeah, our, our data on the adults is, uh, I believe, Similar? you know, 66%. Um, why? I guess I'm wondering. And, and, and that's the, the million dollar question. It's, it's hard to understand um, now, data that I just presented to the state this week shows that, <clears throat> at least in a CDC study that was just performed, your likelihood of a serious, not a serious, but a systemic adverse reaction from the third shot is less than that from the second shot. So that should be reassuring to people who are worried that, oh, I didn't do so well with the first and the second, I don't even want to try the third because it turned out the data would argue against that. So that was very um, pleasing to see at any rate, and hopefully people will take notice of that. 
Um, there doesn't seem to be the sense of urgency that people had when they first got vaccinated. Um, and it's part of pandemic fatigue. It's part of learning to live with the virus and understanding what we've all been through. But it's still a little bothersome to me that uh, even with all the time that people have had, uh, they're not exactly rushing to, to get that booster shot, uh, at least that final third of the, the group that needs to. And you know, this is really what's required when people talk about herd or community levels of immunity. They really want to be immune at uh, that level uh, with the current virus and its current iteration. And it's unfortunate that we just can't uh, have that same sense of urgency applied now, but that's my interpretation. Secretary French, I think, was going to say something as well. Yeah, I was just going to, uh, just an anecdotal observation of the sort of intensity or the need for communication around that, particularly with school employees, wasn't there for boosters like we saw with the initial uh, shots um, for whatever reason. Um, but we know school staff have have participated in that. We did have and if you remember when we first launched um, vaccination for school staff, there was a large number of school staff in Vermont that received the J&J &J vaccine. So we did see a lot of interest when that information was coming out around the booster. What do you, what do, you do if you've had J&J? &J? We did see a lot of uh, interest on the part of teachers and staff around that question. Um, but my general impression is a lot less interest in the booster. I don't see the, the level of activity that we saw with the initial vaccine series. Thank you. Any final guess, Senator Perslick? Um, thank you. I, uh, I hear from constituents about adverse effects from the vaccines and reference to some database of, uh, of adverse effects from vaccines. I'm assuming you get this question every once in a while, uh, Dr. Levine. So I just wonder what, what you, you know, what's the, what's the response to that? What do you recommend we say to our constituents that, that are worried about, about that? Yeah, if by once in a while you mean every week, yes. Uh, uh, so the database is called VAERS, which is a Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It goes to the CDC. Um, it's a uh, publicly available database. I think more practitioners uh, put the data in than the public, but the public still can. Uh, anything that you could remotely construe as an adverse reaction to the vaccine, no matter when it occurred in terms of time after the vaccine, can be put in that system. So it is a broad net that's being cast by having that system. It does get analyzed by the CDC, and that's where we learned a lot about myocarditis, which is one of the more serious, obviously, adverse effects, even though it's quite rare. But that's where the data, uh, one of the places the data came from to help support uh, an understanding and a warning about myocarditis. But generally, most of the people who raise the questions regarding that system want to uh, undermine it uh, in a way because they basically want to say, believe everything in the system and if you do, it means at least 15 people in Vermont have died because they got the vaccine, which of course is not true, or we would be really on top of that. But this stuff does go through vetting by the CDC and further follow-up and analysis so that we can actually know rates of bad, really bad outcomes. And um, the system shouldn't be viewed as this is the truth just because it went into the system. It's what really the analysis of what went into the system uh, is that counts. So and again, not to discount that people have adverse reactions, but the majority of the adverse reactions are either local reactions to the shot or they're what we call systemic reactions that any shot might give you like fatigue or chills or fever um, or what have you. So um, really hard to, um, understand that not every reaction is one that we should take note of and warn people to never get the vaccine about. Thank you both uh, very much. It's very helpful. Appreciate uh, the full hour that you were able to give us. Uh, it means a lot. And we also appreciate everything the two of you continue to do. Okay.
I think we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Yeah. Committee, we have thank you. Uh, right. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Rights and Democracy uh, today is their advocacy day. Uh, we'll take a little break, just a quick stretch, uh, come back uh, at four o'clock, and we will pick up with them. Thanks.